for today's talk. I've prepared some questions, but mm -hmm. as we go along the talk, we can just go with the flow and see um, where the topics lead us. In my words, in my perception, it should be something, it can be something uh, that is closely related to the disrupting of the default mode of the perception of reality. Technically, scientifically, we are hallucinating our, re our reality. So there are some substances that make you switch to another lecture grid, to another reading grid about what reality is. And you switch from an hallucination mode, which we call actually reality, to another hallucination mode. What is interesting is to see that we tend in our culture to privilege one hallucination mode that we call reality. And that, for example, um, what uh, Terence McKenna uh, said, so it's a famous ethnobotanist that wrote a lot about psychedelics and entheogen, that reality is nothing more than a hallucination that is reinforced culturally. So it's a collective hallucination that we call reality because there is a consensus on the way we see what is happening right now. There is also recent studies about that that tend to confirm that, but actually the survival that you are here um, bringing up is the survival of our physical body. So the reality is actually, let's so to say, to narrow it down, is physical and it's related. We made the experiment of this physical reality with our physical body. So it's purely the, the, the survival of the our physical incarnation. But um, there is another way to, to see the same thing is that we, have, we are multidimensional beings. So we exist in different realities, but as soon as we are incarnated into a flesh body, we considered the material reality, the one that is culturally and collectively sanctioned uh, or defined, um, as, as the real one. But actually, when we close our eyes and we start to construct uh, or to have visions, for example, with, with psychedelics, there is another reality unfolding, but nothing in an absolute way says that this alternative reality that you see with psychedelic is less real than this one. What, uh, what defines this reality as more real uh, than the other is actually our way to perceive it with five senses and that makes it real. But actually our five senses has a very, very narrow um, um, spectrum of, of, of perception. We see probably less than one person of the, to of the, of the possible light spectrum and that's the same with the sound. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we, what we call reality is something that is extremely, extremely, extremely narrow. And okay. what I would like to tell is that we, as we are now expressing ourselves from a subjective point of view that is entangled in this reality, it's totally normal that we say this reality is more real than the other ones. But as soon as you switch this subjective way from a transcendent point of view, as soon as you switch this uh, subjective point of view that is uh, an incarnated consciousness into a flesh body to a more absolute point of view or to a transcendent point of view, which you can access and the certain dose, uh, significant dose of psychedelics, then this reality becomes very relative. And it's not anymore the only tangible reality because you create alternative reality. And what's interesting in this alternative realities is that um, you make the experience of something that feels terribly more real than this reality because you access to a, way of perception of an experience that doesn't that is not filtered by our five senses 
but by mm -hmm. a wider, much, much wider and much more intense way of feeling things that is wider, more intense, more deep, and that tra usually transcends time and, time and space. And so, and the psychedelics, and this can relate also to your first question, what is the nature of, uh, of uh, the psychedelic experience? It's transcendent from, it's, it transcends our very, very narrow condition of uh, humans be, human being in a, in a, incarnated in a material body. What is interesting here is that the brain perceives much, much more information that we are conscious about. So the rough number is about 20 million messages per second that the brain is actually processing. But the brain as a very, very efficient tool, only uh, he, he, every second he, he, he filters the number of um, of information of bits that he that are only useful for the survival, so it goes like this: conscious about an enormous part of something every second. Then it narrows down to treat less information to save energy. And we, as very narrow conscious beings, we can be conscious probably about two hundred per second about the smell, the air, the temperature, the the the, the electricity, or of things that are fly, flying a, a around us. So, mm -hmm. um, what I call intuition is the gap between what we can mentally or intellectually process every second and what is actually perceived by the brain. So there is a huge gap between 20 million and 200 that are a number, rough number that are just given as example. There is a huge gap. And this gap cannot be treated intellectually. We cannot be conscious about it and our ego cannot process it. But this gap exists in the brain and is perceived by the body in a total different way that than our ego can do. So sometimes we have a very strong gut feeling, but we cannot say that this is a useful information because our mind or our mental or our ego cannot make deduction and say this is, this is a good feeling or a bad feeling. Just the body says, wow, here I have a very strong intuition. And actually it comes from the huge gap between what is perceived by the brain and what is perceived by our narrow individual uh, ego. To me, the ego can be, um, can be described as um, a program that is uh, for only purpose to, uh, to allow the survival. The ego is actually um, the, the, the metaphor to the computing system. I do a lot because I, I, I find it's very interesting to uh, to compare or to make uh, com um, to, to to make metaphors with uh, the computing system because this is something we start to know in our culture, and the ancient uh, tradition didn't have the computing uh, metaphor uh, to 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 explain what's happening. So we have a new tool here that is deeper than what the ancient had in, in, a, in some way. And so the ego can be, for example, the software based on our, installed in our, in our um, uh, biological body to, to, uh, to allow the individual, the feeling of being an individuality and uh, individual consciousness. So the ego is the thing the default mode of perception of reality that says, I am not you, you are you, I am me, I am an individual being, and I also perceive the limits of my body. For people who, for example, describe an ego death, which can be um, um, a near-death experience, induced or not by psychedelic, but it's really easy to, to achieve that point on psychedelics. And some people achieve that with meditation after 20 years, for example. Um, it's described as a boundary dissolving experience. So mm -hmm. you are uh, emerged into a 
let's say, a dimension or a, a mode of perception of reality where uh, there is no limit between you and what is. And uh, this is the dissolving of the ego, or from psychonauts are calling that sometime ego death. And this is closing the actual um, window, where is the word file where you script your life. So we can compare the ego like a software and you open your software for all your life, you open it around two years old, three years old, and you start to write experiences, life and concepts into words. And everything that is written into that word file or this notepad file constitutes your interaction with reality and constitutes who you are and what do you think the reality is? And there is a narrow interdependence between who you are and what you think the reality is. But this is only stored on the word file, on this window. Psychedelics, for example, makes you for a short moment, if you take enough, close the window, and you are directly in the iOS, in the operating system, where you can open a different software that are not ego related, but more consciousness related. And this other software can be also called other tools. So this is how um, I play the ego using the metaphor of computing. Okay, that's very interesting. That reminds me of the way that Jill Bolt Taylor described her stroke. Um, if you remember, what what do you think? Um, do you think the ego is a left hemisphere phenomenon? Because how she describes the peril, the paralysis of her le left hemisphere and just the activation of her right hemisphere only is very similar to what you're describing right now. This, um, this could probably be science backed, but actually, yes, the left hemisphere is the part that tends to classify, to structure, uh, to narrow down things, to allow us to be able to interact with the material reality uh, in cooperation with the right hemisphere, which has access to things that are much more, um, for example, intuitive, artistic, uh, uh, subjective, and things like that. My personal definition of art is any activity that, um, for example, that, that doesn't process from knowledge or from technique, but that comes from a more intuitive thing. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you try or you start, which is, um, which is wrong what I will say, but it's, it's technically wrong what I say, but as soon as you, as, as you start to, to use a technique or to use something that is ego related or uh, then it ceases to be art. And by the way, it also starts when it ceases to be art, it starts to be measurable and to, to be quantifiable. I don't know if the words exist in English. Mm -hmm or to be rated or things like that. And that's also interesting with art, it's to see the human um, tendency to put a number on it. For example, a price or a ranking or things like that. So how art connects us to the universe, I like to make the link between what we talk about before, intuition and art. Probably art is an attempt to materialize intuition Mm -hmm. So intuition is a huge amount of information that cannot be processed by our ego and our mental uh, mode, but that is nevertheless perceived by our body and by other senses uh, that we are probably not aware of. But it's still here. It's like some, you know, some people that can be called mystics. Uh, yeah, and so from for example, for, for as a simple example, uh, uh, as a simple example, yogi, they are feeling and experimenting things that just cannot be described into words because it doesn't process and is very uh, um, uh, bold to say, but that doesn't process from the brain, and this makes me make the link. Uh, with the sentence that I liked that says, um, believing that the consciousness is in the brain 
is like believing that the orchestra that is playing is in the radio. So consciousness, and when you have experimented um, or experienced uh, high dose of psychedelics uh, and access, access to a boundary dissolving experience, the fact that consciousness is not stored in the brain is just like an astonishing truth that cannot be dismantled, that cannot be denied anymore. You realize into these strong experiences that you are not your body, you're not your brain, and you're not your experiences, you are something bigger. And there is a French mystic that said a, 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 a sentence that is really important to me, and that sums it all, basically. We are not a physical body making a spiritual experience. We are not humans making a spiritual experience. We are spiritual, spiritual beings, only humans. Yeah, only spiritual humans. beings making that's what human or physical experience. Yeah, that's a great phrase. Yeah, this is where I start to be uh, a little bit, a little bit more uh, cocky and a little bit more contradictive because this is, these are just my belief, and uh, I, I could be a little bit more bold by saying that these beliefs are closely related to what mystics or various old spiritual traditions have already written five thousand or four thousand years ago and will be probably proven and science-backed uh, in the next centuries. Um, I wrote once that uh, the total amount of souls in the universe equals one. So uh, this belief, uh, which is basically um, Hinduistic influenced, Hinduistically influenced. Uh, <laughs> influenced uh, by Hinduism. Yeah. Hinduism. So maybe you notice English is not my first language, so I try my best. Never is it mine, it's okay. <laughs> um, I, the, beliefs, the belief is that there is a universal consciousness as one at the beginning. Uh, this proceeds, these beings proceeds from an intention. And the only intention is play and have fun. This is probably to me the deepest intention you can have about life itself. As this thing want to play or have fun or whatever the word we imprint on that sacred, primal, archaic uh, and original intention, uh, it needs to be separated from itself. The eye cannot see itself. It needs a mirror. So the once, that is everything that is, becomes two or becomes the contrary of itself because you can define yourself only if you have a counterpart, only if you have an opposite. I can be good only, only if you are bad. So at first it divides itself to make the experiment about what he is to make the experiment about the polarity. So it becomes two. And now it becomes billions of billions of billions of living beings. And the belief um, can also be expressed as you are the universal consciousness experimenting itself during a short period through a human body. And you are that, and I am that, and every living being is that. And the fundamental purpose of this is to allow something greater, something bigger, to make always a more rich and more deep and more complex experience about what itself is to itself. Yeah, yeah uh, meaning. Uh, Again, that's pure uh, subjective interpretation or belief based on direct experience with entheogens or psychedelics, which are more real than what I am experimenting now, to me at least. Um, I, I strongly believe that we are just tools uh, that allows, first of all, that allows the universal consciousness to make the experiment about itself, to make a richer 
experiment about itself. And how can it be richer through humans is that the humans are uh, regarding the knowledge we have today, the only beings that can be conscious about that, their consciousness. Animals are just conscious, but they're not conscious about their consciousness. And we are the only living being that are conscious about our consciousness. And this brings another layer of complexity to this universal consciousness that wants to make the experiment about the consciousness itself. And um, so another tool that uh, the universal consciousness may use to make a deeper, richer, and more complex experience about reality is life itself. And what supports life? It's nature. And the nature is an infrastructure system that is self-replicating, that supports something that we call life, that supports something that carries, sorry, that carries something that we call universal consciousness. And it is really funny to explore the possibility that we are just a tool to nature, so to life, so to universal consciousness, which are different level of expression of complexity. We're just a tool to allow nature to expand. And probably there is a funny thing to think about or to explore is to imagine that nature or the idea that we have about nature has just created humans to be allowed to be transported to another planet. Because, yeah, how, how the universal consciousness will make a more complex experience about itself is by inseminating the most possible part of matter. And for that, for to inseminate, to inhabit, to incarnate matter, uh, we probably uh, can think that it use nature because this is how life can can uh, go through matter. This thus, thus it becomes nature, and actually to inseminate more matter, more planets, more star system, uh, it needed humans because humans can bring more technology. So I could also continue with the uh, concept of singularity. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the singularity is the, we call the singularity, an event uh, that is so fast and so complex in a system where we cannot predict what will happen. So for example, we can talk here about the uh, technological singularity. Uh, if you look about the technology and the development, if you have access and, and uh, if you have a graph here, a chart, and uh, you look about the technological development of human civilization, it's exponential. So the curve uh, went very flat. Mm -hmm. We discovered the fire and the writings and so on. And then it becomes very steep. And of course, as everybody knows, we made much more technological progress in the last 50 years than during the two or 300,000 years of uh, um, humans walking on two, on two, on two feet. Mm -hmm. So singularity is thus believed to happen around 2060, when artificial intelligence will recreate itself more intelligent than it was the second before. So we will arrive at a point of our technological development where the curve will be extremely steep. Uh, and this event will be a self-replicating AI that takes control about all what has been created, because actually all what has been created is, uh, is uh, stored, we can say, for example, stored in the internet. As soon as an artificial intelligence capable of self-replicating -replic each second, more intelligent than the second before, who has access to internet? Then something will happen and nobody, no futurologist, not even Google can say, uh, this, what, this will happen. We will probably assist into a paradigm shift and the reality will completely change because there will be a supreme being that is constantly self-replicating in an exponential way on a curve that is already extremely steep and that has, that, that has access to all the knowledge of, uh, of the human race. Uh, 
So what's, I will continue just to that. Uh, 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 what is interesting here is as we just see what the technological singularity is to humans, we can imagine that humans are the technological singularity of the vegetal realm. <laughs> the vegetal realm has limits and I strongly believe it has a consciousness that is unique. Uh, probably plants don't have ego. So the vegetal realm is a unique expression as a whole, as a consciousness that supports life to spread itself. And this helps the universal consciousness to make another experiment and more complex experiment about itself. But it was limited. So it developed technologically exactly the same way we are developing ourselves technologically with AI or with computing. But the vegetal realm just uh, developed another technology and the te this technology is biological, which is humans. And humans are developing another technology to do more, to, to, to expand our limits of doable things and to expand our capacity to make a richer experiment about life. This technology we're developing is called AI. And what is really interesting, and this is where you make the round, uh, the, the circle uh, close on the top, is that AI at his uh, extreme level of development will probably reach back nature because nature is the highest form of technology. And when we look at our actual technology, for example, this, this laptop or my iPhone is crazy, crazily, crazily primitive regarding what the rich vegetal realm already does. I'm still a bit hesitating on the conclusion of that question, but I tend to say that this, the digitalization uh, probably distances us from the universal consciousness. I will explain why. And at the end, it will, it will bring us closer. So it's a dichotomic uh, approach. It's a paradox. Uh, when you look at the ancient traditions, they are all, absolutely all have something in common. As they were looking from uh, diverse, um, diverse um, Appellation, I don't have the right vocabulary, but the diverse calling of what enlightenment is. Um, what, they all, what they all had in common was the concept of ascending spiritually, just to go up. And this is really, uh, this triggers uh, my attention. What we are doing now with the digital, digitalization and what's also interesting is that uh, with the announcement of the metaverse, which is a virtual reality where in probably 15 years we can, or 10 years, we can um, uh, indulge into, we can dive into and have a second life. What is really interesting is that we will make, uh, there, we will make an experience of the reality that is much more narrower that the actual reality, because our senses, our five senses will be again narrowed. So uh, in a virtual reality, uh, you, you can think about it as something that we are creating downward our reality. It's like the Russian dolls, you know the Russian dolls? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a doll, a reality inside our reality that you can experiment with less senses. So it's an under reality. But this doll we are in, our reality, is inside another doll. And the other doll is the reality that created our world that is actually probably just a simulation. So what is interesting is to consider the reality and the structure of different alternative reality as fractals. We are now creating, uh, um, uh, I'm searching for the right English word, but a, a downgraded reality into the form of a metaverse. But we are actually the metaverse of another reality that wanted to experiment something. 
So what's really interesting is when you relate this architecture of fractal realities and you relate that with ancient tradition, which are basically saying the same, that they want us to ascend and not to go downward. They don't want us or they don't advise us or they didn't seek, they didn't search for a, a narrower reality, virtual realities. They wanted us to reach our creator, which now we called pretentiously or naively God, but actually is just a reality in which our reality is entangled because I repeat it, something wanted to make the experiment, a richer experiment about itself. And this is what we are actually doing by creating meta metaverses or parallel universes that are virtual or digi digitalized. We want to make richer experiment. So where it, got, where it starts to be really interesting, as we are doing that for fun, for example, in the case of a virtual game, uh, we are constantly trying to make the virtual experiment more immersive. And the kind of the, the ultimate goal would be because we are looking for recreation, the ultimate uh, achievement would be a video game where when we go into, we forgot totally where we come from. We forgot, we forget that we are actually playing a game. This would be the ultimate thing, the ultimate distra distraction, because we don't have this perspective. So we are fully into it, and we can leave the things very, very intensely and probably forget about our problems, our disease, our society, our job. But this is already the virtual reality we are in, and probably and this is what the most rich people on earth allow a part of their wealth is to find out about that. Are we in a simulation game? And it turns out in a statistically approach that we are. And uh, actually we are the experiment of something that is that has the quality of a creator, exactly as we are the creator of a narrower and alternative and virtual and digitalized reality to have more fun. So we are the gods about future realities that we are creating just to have fun. This, I have to make some pop culture references because they just keep yeah. popping to my mind. But first would be, um, I don't know if you've seen AI artificial intelligence. Um, it's a very good movie. And the second one is the uh, Avatar, the movie, because what you're describing just gives me a very intense flashbacks to the Avatar. Um, would you say that's maybe partly a description of what you're saying, that kind of virtual world that's created there? That you're uh, kind of as, I, as I didn't see the first one, uh, it's AI, right? Yes, AI, artificial intelligence. It's just... I, I uh, it describes, I don't know if I can summarize the movie in a sentence, but it's basically um, uh, a fiction movie to a time where artificial intelligence is indistinguishable from humans, kind of, and how, like, the, the moral questions that that poses. And there's just this very interesting phrase there that one of the robots or the artificial intelligence men says, played by Jude Law, by the way, uh, he says, the ones that created us are always looking for those that created them. And that's uh, kind of a very, yeah. I so think. You say uh, that, that in this movie, that. artificial intelligence is indistinguishable from humans, but I would tend to think that in some years, some decades, the artificial intelligence will not be distinguishable uh, from nature itself. And why not from consciousness itself? Because what inter inter artificial intelligence will probably look for is for his own survival. And what more uh, efficient to a survival than an extreme capacity of adaptation? And what has the most extreme capacity of adaptation? Life itself, life always finds a way. So an extreme level of development of artificial intelligence will probably lead it to realize that it needs sun, 
clear water and oxygen to function. So there is a high probability that this artificial intelligence will probably try to preserve nature or has probably high, a high level of uh, ecological consciousness. And I wanted to uh, reflect on Avatar, which mm -hmm. is to me, despite the blockbuster side, uh, incredible masterpiece. Uh, what is really interesting in Avatar is that uh, I know for sure for reliable sources that uh, the filmmaker has been uh, deeply inspired by ayahuasca experiences. So for the people who are watching this, and uh, ayahuasca is a Amazonian brew that contains, uh, amongst other, other molecules, um, a molecule that is called DMT. So uh, DMT is to me more a software than a drug or a psychedelic because it disrupts your uh, default mode of the reality perception and brings you to an alternate reality. And for me, DMT is the molecule that makes you ascend to the dimension of what we call the creators or the creator. So that being said, um, we know now that there is a cutscene in Avatar uh, that you may have seen on YouTube where they are collectively drinking a brew that uh, for many people who know ayahuasca is uh, very um, closely related to ayahuasca and what happens when uh, they drink the, this brew they are connected to a higher consciousness and they can see this higher consciousness manifesting itself through life through nature through themselves and it leads to a boundary dissolving experience and the experience of ayahuasca has been cut from the movie as many, many other sequences that are explicitly talking about DMT. And DMT is a molecule that is produced by our pineal gland. It has been proven, uh, proven that this molecule has neurogenesis and neuroprotective um, um, functions, qualities. qualities. And uh, it is released in the body in a, a crazy amount at the second we die. So this has been uh, measured. Uh, and so actually the, every, absolutely every vegetal species has DMT in it. But there are some species who have much more DMT, which is uh, among a lot is acacia. Uh, or all the family of mimosa. And what's really interesting is that in the Bible, the acacia is uh, probably the most uh, cited plant. In it. it has a really, really central part in the Bible and to some extent into Freemasonry. So acacia has the highest central and fundamental. And when I say fundamental, I cannot stress enough, but I have a, a bold uh, point of view that is one of the topic uh, or the main topic of my next book, which is there is no spiritual feeling without psychedelics. And as we have psychedelics, natural produced psychedelics in our body, uh, we can be spiritual by ourselves, but there is also the capacity we have to use psychedelic to induce deeper uh, spiritual experience. So what is spiritual experience? It's something transcendent, it's something psychedelic that brings you in contact with uh, another kind of reality that is wider, deeper, bigger, much more meaningful, and probably an ascended reality. That is that a reality where this reality is emanating, emerging. So uh, the, the role of psychedelics which uh, is, is fundamental to the, uh, to the religions because it's fundamental to the spiritual being. What is interesting to see, I will try to be more structured here, uh, is that the very primitive um, humanoids didn't share the same, um, the same suspiciousness regarding plants. We are in a culture where we 
cut ourselves for, from everything that is related to the spirit or to the spirituality or to mysticism or to something that is not um, uh, bankable, that is not capitalist. We are cutting ourselves from that. So consequently, we are cutting ourselves from psychedelics. So as I said, these very primal humanoids uh, didn't share the same, uh, uh, I don't know the word, but let's call it suspiciousness. Suspicion. Yeah. Suspicion. <laughs> they didn't share that with us. So they consumed psychedelics. Why not on a daily ba basis? Because when you, when you do it, it's very fun and you have a lot of color and a lot of mind bending and mind altering and mind, mind expanding and consciousness expanding uh, experiences. Some serious theories are uh, one of them is the stoned ape theory uh, says that language up appeared uh, amongst monkey because they consumed psychedelic mushrooms so when the humans uh, started to gather into groups uh, and they started to uh, i don't know the word uh, to not be nomad anymore to be sedentary to stay at one place and this, this started with agriculture uh, they they had uh, different needs that when they were totally wandering so they had things that uh, they had to take care about for example uh, they couldn't be stoned or high uh, all the day long. So this function about gathering spiritual insights were, um, were given to one guy or one woman, probably one woman, in the group. And this was what we call today the shaman. But the shaman at that time, at the very, very, we were talking about probably something about uh, 50,000 years ago, uh, had also the function that is more granular today, a, a function that today we define with a more precision. Uh, it was the shaman was the medicine man, it was a psychologist. It was the guy who was this, or the woman who was deciding where we go to war. He was the mediator, he was, uh, <clears throat> taking psychedelics in probably huge amount to have access to a higher uh, to a higher consciousness to give information to guide to heal to support um, then as the society or the groups grew bigger and bigger uh, we needed probably more structure and as the shaman uh, couldn't for example carry this function for a bigger group uh, uh, there is also something that uh, we have as human is the, the, the primal need of building narrative. Um, so what the shaman sees the other way, and that's also what makes a shaman a shaman, it's not only taking entheogen or plants or psychedelic and tell things, but also the capacity to, to, to transmit the capacity to relate, the capacity to build a very strong narrative about what he seen, what 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 he has uh, seen, because uh, the more relevant that seems or that will seem to people who didn't take psychedelic, the more the function he has will be efficient. So shaman is not only taking plans, but also narrowly related to the capacity of uh, synthesize or narrowing the psychedelic experience or the god godlike experience into language. So this particularity um, drifted into a kind of a common narrative that is um, dedicated to each group, to each civilization. And this became, uh, uh, so to say, this became religions. The narrative that is closely related to a culture. And what, what happened, and this comes uh, mainly uh, from a, a masterpiece, which is the book of Brian Murarescu, which is called immortality key, he explains that Christianity before being a state religion, before being a big institution around a book 
um, and I can talk about the book later, that is the Bible, uh, the three first, at least the three first century after Christ, before um, before the Christianism became something very, very dogmatic. It was a forbidden religion where the psychedelics were very, very central. And this guy, which is to me a genius, uh, did a 12 years work to gather all the proof about the central place uh, of um, at least uh, Amanita muscaria, which is the very well-known um, uh, red mushroom, and also the, um, the ergot, which is the original form. It's a mushroom growing on rye on our cereals that contains LSD. So he makes the link between Christianity in the form that we know today and the ancient mystery cults of Greece that were taking place during more than 2,000 years. So can you imagine that in antique Greece, they were, and, and also the Roman Empire, they were during more than 2,000 years. That's crazy that the stability of these cults are absolutely astonishing. They were cults where the psychedelics were at the center. So you were initiated to these mystery cults. The most famous one is Eloisis or Eleusis in Greece. And you had a sheet load of LSD uh, at the end of the at the end of the initiation. And so it was uh, you were punished by death penalty if you were revealing what you experienced. So very, very, very famous uh, Greek figures, uh, figures, uh, Greek um, people uh, were initiated at Eloisis, like Plato, Cicero, Socrates, all the big uh, were initiated with this LSD experiment. And this is science backed. this is proven. So basically without betraying the secret of what was happening into that mystery call that lasted for more than 2000 years, uh, it's that they died before they died. And this is uh, um, the concept, uh, this is related to the concept of ego death. So dying before you die, so you're not afraid of dying anymore. And you see your life from a totally different perspective. And so as Romans at that time, and here we are at the first or second century after Christ, needed more control over the Greek culture and the, 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 the two cultures were very entangled. Uh, they started progressively, especially after the third century, after this, the second half of, of, the, of the fourth century, sorry, uh, they started to forbid this cult and to forbid the practice of psychedelics. So Christianism became more and more an underground religion. And uh, so he, he explains it crazily good in that book with a, a lot of proof and, uh, and with disciplines that are, can be called archaeochemistry and archaeobiology, where they found uh, the, the ships or the, 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 or the bowls where the, 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 the ritual bowl where they were drinking this substance that were we'll called kaikion uh, at, that, at that period. And they found that there was LSD and Amanita muscaria in it, so the red mushroom. So it's, it's just proven that the Christianism is very, very um, closely uh, related, and this is uh, an euphemism to say that, uh, to the Greek mysteries, what, which were, were using a high dose of psychedelic during 2000 years. And I will finish on that because I'm very long now. Uh, in, in, the, in the comparative mythology, there is a tremendous common points between Dionysos, which is the god of uh, the drunkness and uh, I, I don't know how to say in English, but the, the God of excess and rituals and things like that. Yes. And Jesus, it's fantastic. When you read the Bible or the story of Jesus uh, through the scopes of the psychedelic practice and through the scope and through the filter no, of knowing who Dionysus and the myth of Dionysus was. It's just a transcription, a pure transcription of one myth that comes from the Greek culture to another culture that became uh, Christianity. No, oh, sorry, that was really long. That was very interesting. It's just, I keep 
getting questions and losing them along the way. But um, I would say myth is a ve ve vehicle to 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 carry uh, a narrative, and this narrative has highly been ex experienced because the, the the narrative is fundamentally the mythology. So to, so to speak about the Greek mythology, at least, is deeply, deeply spiritual. It explains, it's extremely deep. It, it explains also our psychological bias. It explains our psyche, consti psyche constitution. Uh, and this is an attempt to carry very deep ID through metaphors. Uh, would you say the role of religions is the same? Yes, totally. Totally. Um, um, me, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, now I, I, I could say that religion is mythology plus dogma, or mythology uh, with yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. And also uh, at the period at the, the yeah the, the, when and when that was the uh, mystery cults in ancient Greece, starting at least two thousand BC. Uh, mythology was also an attempt to direct the psychedelic experience. The psychedelic experience, if if it's done with important doses that leads to ego death, uh, he's uh, is highly also highly influenced by your expectations, by the set and the setting. Uh, so, in your environment, uh, which is uh, part of the set and setting, uh, so mythology could also have been an attempt uh, to give a spiritual di direction uh, to, to the psychedelic experience. So we were, uh, for example, telling a myth, a myth uh, during six days of the initiation or playing, because there was also theater play in that, uh, in that experience. Um, uh, to make that uh, experiment to the to the participant, and then the seventh day was the day apparently where they drank drank the kaikion, which was this psychedelic psychedelic brew, in a sort of releasing of revelation or orgasm about the the, the spiritual uh, things that were teached before. So now we realize <clears throat> with our uh, psychedelic experiments, for example, with mushroom or with ayahuasca, that our diet has a huge impact on the nature of the, the psychedelic experience. So just for example, uh, with uh, ayahuasca, um, which is a, an Amazonian plant and brew, um, you have to respect a very strict diet uh, uh, let's say two weeks before, because you have interactions, molecular interactions in your body that can be deadly with some molecules that are present uh, in the brew. Uh, uh, we know that, for example, for people who take MDMA, that the experiment is much stronger when you are with an empty belly, uh, an empty stomach, uh, that's if you do it just after eating. And some strong experiment can lead to throwing up. So it's also interesting, for example, to not throw up. But also fasting has a spiritual uh, function in itself because digesting food is actually uh, uh, taking a lot of energy. Um, so it may disrupt our meditation, for example. It may disrupt uh, our process of thinking. I like the idea to, that says that we are in a huge inverted psychedelic trip, trip because it's 200 years that we are high on meat and on sugar. Or down on meat and down on sugar. So <laughs> if you try, if you start to meditate and to diet, as soon as you integrate in your diet sugar again or meat again, you see the horrible effect it has on your level of consciousness. You get kind of numb or dulled, I don't know the word, but it has an effect that is totally 
opposite or inverted as a psychedelic trip. A psychedelic trip opens your consciousness to the higher understanding of reality. Sugar, alcohol, uh, opiates. Mm, I may be a little, little bit hesitant on opiates because there are many ways to use it. But for example, alcohol and sugar and meat is a terrible tool to narrow down your perception. Coffee also, it narrows down and psychedelics do the opposite. So this would be um, how I would illustrate the importance on uh, the food, the diet and the fasting on how on our spiritual development. I'm not at all a specialist about dream, but I tend to be very close to Carl Gustav Jung uh, conceptions that basically says that our subconscious has his own language. And this subconscious is, could be, for example, considered as our real spiritual parts because it's unconscious. Uh, it is related to the other unconscious. It is related to the collective unconscious about our species. And uh, it has messages from us for to the this, that uh, are directed um, or intended to be perceived by the upper layer of our consciousness, which is the ego. And so, when we sleep, we are not distracted by our senses. So we are into direct communication with the um, the sunken part uh, of the iceberg. So we can describe the relation between consciousness and subconsciousness, or uh, let's, we can also say the ego and the soul, for example. This is just words and concept, like an iceberg. There is a very small part that is out of water, and this is the consciousness or the ego. And the biggest part is underwater. But that's really, really interesting in, in, in such image that I use often is that um, two icebergs that are totally separated in the sea are related by the water. And the ice composing the iceberg is that this exact same substance as the water itself that is relating this iceberg to another iceberg. So you just have to elevate your vibrational state, your consciousness to change the ice into water. To be in communication with other beings. And this is as true as I can express it. This is a, a, a very, very tangible reality for the people who can go into deep states of meditation, uh, especially with psychedelics, where you enter a perception about um, another mode of reality, an alternative reality, where everything is connected. And the dreams are, to me, an attempt of this subconscious and collective part, which has also uh, individual parts, uh, to communicate with our consciousness. And it uses uh, a language that is proper to that. And the language is built on archetypes and symbols. What is fascinating with archetypes, and this is the definition of an archetype, it's a, uh, it's a, a concept or a, a symbol that has a common meaning through the cultures and through the, um, and through the, um, through the ages. So in a symbol, uh, there is a part of our interpretation that doesn't belong to us that belongs to our, uh, uh, to our, uh, to the, to, to the human race. So for example, a snake can have uh, interpretation. Uh, you can interpret the symbol of the snake uh, with your own experience, but there is a deep, deep uh, feeling that doesn't belong to you, but to the humankind. And uh, this is the language that our dreams uh, are using to communicate with our consciousness. And why do they communicate? Uh, we, we, I, I, can, I can relate that to the very first questions we had in this video. It's again, what I believe to be the intention of a collective consciousness to guide us uh, like tools that would serve it to make a more rich and more rich experiment about what we call reality.
Yeah, there are things that are now called Wim Hof technique, but these things are uh, uh, closely, very closely related to techniques that were already used 2000 years ago by yogi uh, and breathing technique that has been detailed in many ancient texts. The, the question, the tricky question here, or the provocative question is, uh, were those techniques elaborated with or without psychedelics? So as psychedelics are substances that makes you much more conscious and much more opened, it is for me uh, not really crazy to think that we use psychedelics to have a higher consciousness on what was the impact of breathing. As here, I have a very narrow point of view and a very narrow consciousness because I didn't take psychedelics. I would have a certain point of view of my breathing exercise that I would try to bring, to bring up. But if I take psychedelic, every breathing movement has a direct impact on consciousness when you're in psychedelics. If you stop breathing, something happened. If you breathe, something happened. If you breathe something faster, something happened. If you hold your breath when the breath, when your rib is empty, your rib cage is empty, your, your, your lungs are empty, something happened. And if you hold your breath when it's full, something else happened because there is oxygen in your body, more oxygen, and, and so it's different. So I strongly believe that these breathing techniques that are thousands of years old and who Wim Hof is just a re-inventor uh, were conducted and were elaborated through psychedelics. So of course this implies that uh, these techniques bring us closer to what we could call universal consciousness or enlightenment or whatever you call it, nirvana, samadhi or satori regarding the culture. Um, Yes, um, that, that's what I wanna say about the breathing technique. There is also something that is not from Wim Hof, but from Tan Stanislas Grof that you may know, which is called holotropic breathing. And also more recently, a technique that is called rebirth. Uh, it's also a, a breathing technique that can bring you into alternative state of consciousness. The thing is now, this question is also always asked by people who are really skeptical to psychedelics, but I know that's not your case, uh, because we are in a culture where we are demonizing uh, psychedelics as drugs, but actually it's something totally different from what we can, uh, what we could imagine as drugs like cocaine, heroin, opiums, and things like that. Um, so we tend, we have the tendency to say, ah, oh, we don't need psychedelics because we can achieve that by ourselves but there is a different posture that uh, we can call humility. And with humility, you may position yourself by saying, I cannot do it alone. It's not possible. I need a tool. So saying I can reach, and I know I may sound really provocative here, but saying I can reach enlightenment without psychedelics is like saying I can survive without food. Why, why would I do that? Why would I consider food as something non-natural? I considered food as something totally natural and beneficiary and, and positive for my, for my well-being. Why do I exclude psychedelics from my diet? This is a pure, pure nonsense. So we are in the middle ages of spirituality. We are in a dark age of spirituality by cutting ourselves from the tools of nature. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, as humans, we have uh, a dual, a dual uh, nature. We are spirits or soul, whatever you call it, into material body. So this has been expressed by the Christian cross, which is vertical and horizontal. And the human is sitting at the intersection of the horizontal plane, which is material, and the vertical plane, which is spiritual. And this is our condition, we are dual. So if you want to be 100% material and down to earth, then we don't have any spirit anymore. And we are just stones or plants, I don't know. So this is not our nature. And if we want to be spiritual, 
then we don't have any body anymore. We are not into matter, so we die. So our the, the human experience experience itself is entangled into a dual nature. We are the intersection of a spirit and matter. And this is probably why we, and I, I know I may sound really provocative by saying that, that we cannot reach enlightenment without tools of nature. I also use this metaphor. Um, um, I, I, I really, in my, on my path, I really liked to ask this question to other people. Can we reach enlightenment with or without psychedelics? Do we have to take psychedelics? So there is a, a very strong tendency to say, we don't need psychedelics. So this tendency is to me very, very culturally influenced. Uh, but this position, this point of view is generally adopted uh, by people who did meditation without psychedelics. So of course, if I did meditation without psychedelics, I can reach enlightenment without psychedelics. And people who only did psychedelics without meditation, they say, no, there is no way you can do that with meditation. What is interesting is the point of view of people who try the both path, who try the both way, people who did 30 years of meditation and 30 years of experiment of psychedelics. And this is where it gets really interesting uh, because these people may uh, usually speak from a common voice. And this voice is meditation is the way, psychedelic is the destination. Meditation is the path that leads you to destination, but you cannot reach destination without psychedelics. But if you reach the destination without having done the path, you will not understand a single peck of what's happening at destination. It's like parachuting a three years old child on the top of the Everest. And he will immediately say, wow, it's pretty cold here. It's beautiful, but I want to go back in my room because I'm cold. He's not prepared, he didn't, he didn't do the, 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 the path. So he doesn't give a fuck about what's happening on the top of the Everest, he never dreamed about. But you have thousand people down there that are climbing the Everest that will probably never reach the top. But once they reach the top, they will uh, be, um, um, they will experiment an infinite delight because they dip the path and they know the value of being parachuted in top of the Everest. So this is how I will put it to answer the question is meditation and natural techniques are the path. Psychedelics are the destination. You cannot understand or experiment the real destination or the full aspect of destination without having a spiritual practice that can be, I speak now about meditation, but it can also be yoga, for example. It can be praying, it can be mantra, it can be, there is so much psychedelic pra um, um, spiritual practice. But to my point of view, they were absolutely all created and enhanced under the influence of psychedelics that were revealing the deep uh, meaning of them. So you would advocate for a combination of psychedelics and spiritual practices like meditation? In a country where it would be legal, uh, I would I would advocate. Yeah, I mean, no. If anyone is uh, thinking about trying psychedelics, uh, advocating for not trying them in isolation, but as a part of a larger kind of spiritual experience. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it has to be seen as a tool. It's just a tool. And with a tool, like a hammer, for example, you can kill someone and you can build a house. So a tool uh, can be really, really dangerous. And I like to see psychedelics as a, a chainsaw in the middle of a schoolyard. It's extremely, <laughs> yeah, it's extremely dangerous. Nobody would advise in the schoolyard take the, the chainsaw. There is probably years of study and precaution to you for a child to use a chainsaw. And, and, and in no case, a child would use a chainsaw or play with it. So this is what, this is where the notion of danger comes into play. It's not about the substance itself, but who use it with what intention and how. 